Um, I don't have any disclosures to make. I will be talking, as you can see here, about supporting the well-being of persons with dementia through the arts. Um, let's see, let's keep going. And our, um, my objectives for this talk is I hope by the end that you'll be able to discuss the impact of dementia on mental well-being, that you'll be able to give two examples of experiences with the visual arts with persons with dementia, as well as discuss how music interventions may provide cognitive and emotional benefit for persons with dementia. So um, I got really interested in this topic, really probably this summer it really came to me because I want to tell you about this summer was very newsworthy from the standpoint of dementia. Four big topics, big newsworthy um, items were out in the news and I'm, that caught my attention. One, um, some I'm going to talk about very briefly and others I'm going to talk about in more detail. First of all, as you probably heard this summer, we heard about lecanemab, which received FDA approval uh, for, for treatment for patients who have early onset, um, early stage Alzheimer's disease. And again, lecanemab, as you probably know, is an amyloid beta-directed antibody. We also heard this summer about Quest, um, which introduced the first market to consumers blood test that could be done, that consumers could get themselves to find out about their particular risk for Alzheimer's disease, measuring two biomarkers. Um, it's a little bit of concern to me about talking about both of these. They have some controversial aspects I'm not going to share with you, other than to say that Alzheimer's disease and dementia very much are in the news. But a third um, topic that came up this summer really grabbed my attention. This was a study that was published in Alzheimer's and Dementia. And what the study researchers did is they studied the estimate of the prevalence and number of people who were living with Alzheimer's disease among those individuals aged 65 and over in all 50 states, and they specifically focused on over 3,100 counties. Um, they noted that right now this is a big topic of, of concern because 6.7 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease. That number is expected to double by 2050. And I do want to remind you, Alzheimer's disease, of course, is the most common form of dementia, affecting about two-thirds of people who have dementia. So this number of 6.7 doesn't capture all the numbers of people we have in this country with, who have dementia. But what the researchers did is they used cognitive data from the Chicago Health and Aging Pro Project combined with the National Center for Health Statistics and they found and estimated that the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is the highest in four states and you'll see Maryland is one of those states that they estimate to have the highest prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. When they specifically apply this to look at estimates for prevalence by county, they noted that the, that the three counties that had the highest prevalence, one was Baltimore City, which you know, Baltimore City isn't a county, but it probably is the only city that's not in a county. So that's one of the quirks of Baltimore. But also that the rates are very high in Prince George's County for Alzheimer's disease. So this is a very relevant topic for us, particularly for me as a geriatric psychiatrist. We certainly know that prevalence rates of dementia everywhere are high. They're high here. We need to be paying attention to it. And despite years of active research, and despite even a medication like lecanemab, there really, even that is not a disease modifying or a curing treatment. At best, if it works, it's going to slow down a little bit the progress of the disease. We, don't, we know a lot about the progression of Alzheimer's disease. We know that what happens over time. We know a lot about the, what we think we know, all know a lot about the pathology in the brain. And we also know that neuropsychiatric symptoms are very common, affecting close to 100 a percent of people at some point. However, however, not as much has been done to talk about, well, what about really the quality of life and how can we maintain well-being in people um, who maybe aren't experiencing neuropsychiatric symptoms or whose symptoms are under control. Well-being in dementia affects not only the person with dementia, but their because family caregivers do so much. We know that more than one million family and other unpaid get caregivers are providing frontline care to a family member with Alzheimer's disease. This comes to some these crazy numbers, 18 billion hours of care. Who can even fathom what that means? 
We know there's a very strong literature that family caregivers themselves are at increased risk for emotional distress and negative mental and physical health problems. And so among the ways that we need to take care of our patients who have Alzheimer's disease and dementia is to support the well-being of their spouse caregivers. But what about those individuals themselves who have, you know, who have dementia? So I would say, in my experience as a geriatric psychiatrist, dementia is the most feared diagnosis among older adults. Even, I would say, uh, um, one of my favorite essays was written by the neurologist um, Oliver Sacks, and he wrote a beautiful essay when he turned 80 about what it meant to him to t turn 80, and he didn't have dementia at the time. He didn't have the, the melanoma yet that eventually, you know, he would, would be fatal for him, but he described in that essay that with him all the time, he said, the specter of dementia looms, something that even for him was on his mind. And why is that? And I think that's because this is really a condition where dementia is seen as a medical model of deficit. We always think about it in terms of loss, loss of autonomy, loss of control, loss of relationships, loss of self-esteem. Um, and as well, there really is a lot of stigma about dementia, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about that, but individuals who have dementia and their spouses often feel their friends treat them a little bit differently. And there's, it's hard to integrate socially with other people. Even more, we have to worry about increased risk for suicide. And in fact, this is a, just one slide to show you that this is a national retrospective longitudinal cohort study of, of Medicare beneficiaries followed for a year after they received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and what they found is that among this group, suicide deaths were 50 53% higher when compared with um, um, a population of individuals age matched controls who do not have Alzheimer's disease. So some people feel a tremendous sense of despair just getting the diagnosis, which might be very early on before they really have any significant impairment. In recent years, there's been a lot of focus on are there non-pharmacologic lifestyle approaches that can support brain health and help delay dementia, or once someone has cognitive impairment, perhaps to delay the progression, knowing that we don't have cures or ways to reverse cognitive impairment. And we really have very strong evidence base for the benefits of physical exercise, particularly aerobic exercise. We know it's important to treat hypertension and control blood pressure. We know the importance of social connections in maintaining brain health. And then there's been a lot done about diet, but um, some evidence to show that particularly these diets, the Mediterranean diet, high in um, in fiber and in greens, that sort of thing, can also help protect the brain. We know a lot about sleep. Uh, we also know that you want to treat depression and make sure that that is under control. And we also know that once somebody gets diagnosed with dementia, it's not the end, it's the beginning of a journey. And we really need to take a multi-pronged approach helping patients and their families, thinking about things like managing other conditions, educating them, coordinating care among physicians, helping family caregivers feel that they have developed the skills over time to help their family member with dementia. But I put highlighted in yellow, I think an area that's deserving of more attention that sometimes doesn't always get enough, which is to really help target with patients and their families activities that are meaningful to them and that bring purpose to their life, that can help maintain their sense of identity in relationship with each other. So with all of that introduction, that brings me to really the question is, so can the arts, can that be one of those non-pharmacologic approaches that can help sustain well-being with aging and with dementia? And what do we know about it? So I want to start by telling you that this has been a topic that a lot of organizations have been paying attention to, including the World Health Organization. And in 2019, they issued a report of a scoping review that they had, where they were really asked the question, which, what is the evidence on the role of the arts in improving health and, and well-being in general? I mean, not really focusing particularly on cognitive impairment. It was a pretty good report that actually covered over, over 3,000 studies, um, over 900 pop, uh, publications were identified, and 200 actual reviews. 
And they concluded that from this report, the bottom line was yes, they felt the arts could impact mental and physical health. And particularly, they talked about that it, perhaps the literature supported that it could have a role um, in encouraging um, health promoting behaviors and supporting caregiving. I've highlighted the ones in yellow that really relate to older adults. And that from a management treatment standpoint, they felt that the arts, there was evidence showing that it helped people experiencing mental illness and those with neurodevelopmental and neurological disorders of which dementia would be one of them. So in, which really then brings me to this question, which is can engaging with visual art, I wanna talk now about visual art, what do we know about visual art and the promotion of well-being in individuals with dementia? And there is a growing literature supporting the benefits of engaging with visual art. We know that in-person engagement with art is associated with positive outcomes. A really terrific program that's gone on for many years is called Meet Me at MoMA. MoMA, if you're not from New York, you might not know. It's the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And for many years, they had a program for caregivers and their family members with dementia together, a specific art program at the, at the gallery. And they would come and they'd have specific events and activities that they would do together for the caregivers and their family member. This was studied and the researchers found that those who participated in the program had improvements in well-being. They rated themselves higher on, on self-esteem and quality of life. During the pandemic, Kind of a similar uh, program was done using online digital art with family members and individuals uh, with dementia and also feeling, they also said that they felt that their intervention supported improvement in mood, anxiety, loneliness, and well-being. There's a very interesting study out of Australia in which the, the researchers studied 15 people with mild to severe dementia who visited the National Gallery of Australia one week, one hour a week for six weeks. They too used kind of quality of life kind of questionnaires, but they did something different that the other studies didn't do. What they did is they, they, had a, they developed a form of systematic behavioral observation to record how was the individual with cognitive impairment reacting in the moment, and in the moment of how they were reacting while they were experiencing this art experience. And they noted that you know, while they were in the gallery, they saw high levels of what they called engagement, involved with the social interaction. And after they returned, some of the staff said that residents seemed a little more animated and a little bit more talkative. These effects dissipated quickly. But I think one of the points that came out of here is that in the moment observations really complemented and perhaps added richer data than you could get from self-report of people trying to reflect on it later. There's a, a similar thing, uh, approach was done in another study out of England and Wales. And in this study, the um, what the researchers did is they studied three, diff three different cohorts. They were really from nursing homes, and they instituted a 12-week program where each week there was a two-hour program of not going to an art gallery but doing an art-based activity. And again, what they found is that they used some sort of behavioral observation in the moment, in real time, to assess how the individuals were benefiting, and they felt compared to those who weren't involved in the art activity, there were well-being improvements in terms of they're enjoying it, they seemed involved, and they seemed that they uh, got something out of it in terms of well-being. So I think what these studies are showing to us is that Yes, I think engaging with visual art um, for individuals with cognitive impairment and dementia can improve a sense of well-being. We need to not only get a sense of, uh, perhaps not only to look at what is done in terms of clinical outcomes or in terms of, of how they feel later, but I think in the moment observation is very valuable because afterwards uh, patients with dementia might not remember be able to recall or even put into words what the experience was like. I think it is important to know in these different studies that while improvement is seen in the short run, there's not sustained improvement. It's not like you can implement an arts-based activity and then feel like it's going to last a long time, which also shows to us that in, if these are going to have a scalability, if we're going to be implemented um, in, in the community, we need to think of a ways for them to be, for to be sustained, and perhaps the sustainability uh, requires really um, maintenance sessions. I'm going to turn now and talk about what do we know about music. 
And I'm going to tell you about this, which is uh, the global, this is really shortly before the pandemic, very interesting, that um, AARP, which um, used to be known as the American Association for Retired Persons, but I found out in 1999 they dropped it and they only use a a AARP now. They don't want to be known as retired persons because they are advocating for all people over the age of 50. Anyway, they convened a group of experts um, called the Global Council on Brain Health to review what is the evidence base specifically about how music might influence brain health. And what they concluded from their review is that they said, yes, music is a powerful force. It, the literature shows it can improve mental health and well-being. They spoke, they noticed particularly about studies that show that playing an instrument throughout one's life was associated with a lower risk for dementia, and that the brains of professional musicians seem to show resilience, um, and they wondered whether that might even apply, they don't know, whether it might apply to those adults who learn to play instruments later in life. So they talked about what the literature showed and but perhaps where the questions are. At the same time, as AARP had convened the experts, they also sent a survey um, uh, to a nationally representative um, group of adults to really ask them to get a sense of how they would rate their engagement with music and how they would self-rate their cognitive and, bra and brain health. And they found as a result of this survey that adults who were 50 and older who reported that they were more actively engaged with music were slightly more likely to self-rate their cognitive function highly. Now, of course, these are self-report studies maybe, but I'm going to talk to you about studies that are more rigorously done and really looked at, so what, what do we know about um, um, music training on cognition? So Strong and Mast did a very interesting study where they gave neuropsychological testing that was done pretty extensive to three groups of individuals, those who had studied an instrument for long, continuously for 10 years or more, those who had studied it for up to 10 years, and those who had never played an instrument at all. And they found with the neuropsychological testing they did that there was a difference. Those who had 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 studied an instrument and were musicians of some degree for a longer period of time performed better on a number of different cognitive tests. They performed better on tests of visual spatial abilities and better on language abilities, which is very interesting. They also performed better on some tasks of executive functioning. And so they really concluded from that that perhaps long-term musical training that starts earlier in life may be protective for brain health and protective for cognitive aging and perhaps could contribute to what we could call this concept of cognitive reserve, which is the idea that the brain can sustain insults and changes related to aging and yet function adequately. We know that cognitive reserve is strengthened by education. The higher education you have, the more cognitive reserve we believe people have Perhaps instrument uh, practice and training also from early on could be one aspect that contributes to cognitive reserve. In studies that have looked at the possible neural basis for these differences, we know from imaging studies, for instance, that in professional musicians we see an increase in gray matter and auditory, motor, and visual areas. Of, of the brain and also an, an enlargement of the anterior corpus callosum, perhaps suggesting that there's more connectivity between hemispheres. And also noting that music and language do share some properties similarly and that they both are related to the acoustics, they have a syntax, and maybe there is neural processing that's similar to both of them. Interestingly, you know, in these studies, there not, isn't necessarily with music an improvement in what we might call episodic or biographical memory, and it seems to be that musical activity engages um, a different type of long-term memory, which is implicit, unconscious memory, of which procedural memory is an example. She has lost episodic autobiographical memory and has short-term memory impairment. Her implicit procedural memory for music is sustained and is maintained. So when we think about, you know, why we might want to be focusing um, Again, on music, you know, on music and instruments, we think about um, there's a growing interest in, again, this idea, are there lifestyle act, things that people can engage in that can help promote brain health? Playing an instrument 
is a particularly interesting task, which in involves a lot of cognitive processes. You can think about it. It involves visual, auditory, tactile, motor symptoms, systems, sensory, I would say also limbic and emotions. I mean, what other task, cognitive tasks can you think of that engage the whole brain in such a complex and integrated way? So we know that when we give cognitive training to older adults, for instance, and particularly focused on attention or, or processing speed, they can get better on that task, but it doesn't generalize to other aspects of their life, perhaps a cognitive engagement intervention like music, it's been proposed, could generalize to everyday activities because it's really more, I'm gonna say, these are my words, a br total brain workout. So I'm gonna talk to you about a couple of studies that have done just that, that have used um, instrument playing as an intervention with, with um, and so, this is a study where the researchers looked, they, this was a, a systematic review and meta-analysis, and they looked at studies whose goal was to improve cognitive functioning, and they looked at studies that involved percussion or piano. Interestingly, they found for those older adults who, whose, cog, whose intervention involved learning to play an instrument, they did s seem to have cognitive benefits, in terms of improvement in executive functioning and processing speed. But these were healthy controls, healthy adults. No one had done studies of learning a new instrument, of, probably for obvious reasons, in those individuals with dementia or real cognitive impairment, where the involvement might have been just playing a percussion instrument, but wasn't really, um, they were really looking at improvement in, in t at intention. In this study, um, is interesting to me because the researchers gave um, the intervention was teaching a group of older adults to play the piano who had never played before. Um, and they were looking at cognitive improvement, but they looked at well-being as well. It was a pretty rigorous study for those who participated. They had to take a one-hour lesson for 10 weeks. They had to practice 30 minutes a day. That's a lot. Um, they did find at the end there was some improvement in visual perceptual activity but more interesting to me is when they did focus groups at the end, people talked about an improvement in self-efficacy. They felt a sense of competence and achievement. They felt an improvement in a sense of well-being. So I've spoken to you about instruments and intervention studies. What do we know about singing? Because not everybody plays an instrument, but singing is something that's probably more accessible to everybody. And indeed, people have studied the impact about well-being, um, on well-being, for those individuals who sing. Um, Dakin et al. did a systematic review of 61 studies and concluded that singing and music enhanced morale, reduced risk for depression in older adults. And then a study was done in Rome where older adults were specifically recruited to join a new singing group that was only created just for the research purpose, but they did find that those who participated report a decrease in anxiety, some improvement in depression scales um, from participating in the program. Once the research program was over, those, uh, I guess it doesn't surprise me that those improvements weren't sustained. Again, I think for arts activities to have benefit, there needs to be more of a longitudinal commitment. So which then brings me to talk more specifically, what do we know about music and dementia? Well, first of all, we know that persons with dementia enjoy music. They don't lose the ability to respond emotionally to music. We also know that individuals who have dementia can identify familiar music. They can often recall and sing along familiar lyrics to songs that they know. They can identify titles of songs. They can correctly perceive pitch and melody. There have been a number of studies focused on the use of listening to music uh, to treat uh, neuropsychological and behavioral symptoms of dementia, patients who are agitated. It is helpful for that, but not necessarily better in studies than other uh, non-pharmacologic approaches. But singing has been studied um, compared to music listening and enhancing working memory and episodic memory in persons with dementia. And this brings me to the fourth news article that, that really caught my attention this summer related to Alzheimer's disease, and that was on July 21st, the singer Tony Bennett passed away at the age of 97. And for those of you, I don't know how familiar you are with Tony Bennett, but he was an American jazz vocalist who had this extraordinary eight-decade musical career, 
the winner of 19 Grammy Awards, Lifetime Achievement Award from the Recording Academy. And interestingly, at the age of 85, he started recording albums with Lady Gaga, kind of an unexpected coupling of to be working with her. Um, also importantly, he was started to be diagnosed in 2015 with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and and he, the, for, the official diagnosis was in 2017, but he continued to perform even after he started to develop Alzheimer's disease. In February of 2021, he, um, he announced, or his family announced, or his publicist announced on what used to be called Twitter, that he had Alzheimer's disease. But of particular interest is that in August of 2021, at the age of 95, and listen to this, six months after he uh, acknowledges his diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, he and Lady Gaga performed two concerts together in Radio City Music Hall. Afterwards, there was a CNN special. I mean, they really talked about this in November, what this concert was all about, and I just copied this because I couldn't paraphrase this in better words. But I wanted to tell you that it's very interesting in blue. Family members told 60 Minutes they weren't sure what would happen, actually, during the show. They were pretty nervous about him performing with Lady Gaga at this point because family members said that sometimes he didn't know where he was and he didn't know what was happening around him. But his wife said that once she saw him on stage and his eyes were twinkling, his arms were outstretched toward the crowd, she knew everything was gonna be all right. And she said, he became himself. He just turned on. It was like a light switch. And here's a picture of the two of them from that concert. I mean, look how fantastic he looks at 95. He just looks like he's in his element on stage. Afterwards, this is what Lady Gaga had to say about the experience of performing with him. And she said, it's not a sad story. It's emotional. It's hard to watch somebody change. I think what's been beautiful about this and what's been challenging is to see how it affects him in some ways, but to see how it doesn't affect his talent, I think he really pushed through something to give the world the gift of knowing that things can change, but you can still be magnificent. So I wanna tell you about one other music experience, and this is with people who aren't me mega stars and superstars in music, but a, choral, a chorus in New York City called The Unforgettables, started by an NYU physician at Lang Langone Medical Center, Mary Middleman. So she started this group, this chorus in 2011, and it's for caregivers and their family members with dementia. It's a choral singing group. And she has studied it, and the group themselves um, gave themselves the name The Unforgettables and they perform for family and they perform for friends and she, had the, she and the conductor had studied this and published it, uh, their findings and what they found when they did a follow up of people who belonged to the group from intake you know, to this time when they studied it is that there was improvement in quality of life and well-being, not only for the persons with dementia but also for their family caregivers. And among the things that came out of the focus group were quotes like the, that this was so valuable to them because they were belonging to a group having a normal activity, um, and that learning new skills together really bonded the two of them together. And so sort of bringing this talk a little bit to a close, I really want to sort of share with you that I think that perhaps, perhaps, engagement with the arts, with visual arts, and with music could, fulfill, could, be, could, could fill a, a gap that we have right now in caring for older people, particularly given the lack of curative treatment. It's really important that we sustain well-being and focus on quality of life for individuals with dementia and with their families. A lot of the research up till now has really very much been focused about how creative arts uh, uh, can reduce sort of these sort of behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, and that's good, but focusing on quality of life and giving meaning and purpose is very important. And I think as you've seen, I hope you've seen, and we've demonst demonstrated by sharing some of these studies with you, engaging with art can reveal the, the strengths that remain with the person with dementia, both to themselves and to their family and caregivers, and validates an ongoing sense of personhood. The, the person isn't lost as well as participating in the arts creates opportunities for more socialization, which in themselves can support self-esteem and also um, and meaning. And one last thing, which is how do we scale this up? How do we implement this? And in this regard, 
I think that our, our colleagues across the pond in England are ahead of us because the National Health Service in 2019 sort of developed six pillars of comprehensive model of personalized care and one of their pillars um, is called social prescribing. And what they've done is they've created a whole new category of health worker called the link worker, whose job is to connect with general practitioners in medical practices and with the patients with community resources to in, uh, help that person stay engaged in social and meaningful activities. They don't specifically identify the arts or music as something in this regard, but I, th I think it falls very much under that category. That that w and so I think what we could do as clinicians is be thinking about social prescribing and thinking about how the art, prescribing the arts to help support resilience and social engagement in our older patients. Much more research is needed to understand more specifically which interventions are the most effective. And of course, we really need this kind of infrastructure and healthcare support to implement it more at the wider level. But thank you very much, and I th hopefully there's maybe five or six minutes left for discussion. Really interesting presentation, Dr. Raymond. Thank you. Uh, the uh, the idea of your your concept of music as a route to enhancing well being is is a, seems like a terrific one. And uh, I know that would resonate with you because you love terrific. music. Yeah, it's terrific. And, and you, well, and you course, always bring it to well, us well, every week. Well, of course, week. yeah. There are lots of people who like music. There are lots of people who have ability with music, which I don't. And 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 if you have ability, it, it makes a ton of sense. I guess when it comes to people who who don't have so much ability, one of the things I think of is, uh, is church or synagogue or other places of worship where you do, often, you do get people coming together where everybody's singing whether they're good singers or not. It, that's, that's certainly one thing that brings people together. I guess I'm wondering if, if, that's, ever, if that's ever been a part of your, your process of sort of working with patients, encouraging, encouraging that as a, as, a, as a form of expression, either musically or more broadly socially. Yeah. So that's a great, you know, of, of course, particularly when it comes to singing in a church, we have to remember we're just coming out of a pandemic where that was something people could not do. Um, and that was, uh, was a big, you know, certainly was a big problem, particularly for older people. You know, what I find is those people who have had a lifelong interest in music and performing and have been a part of singing um, want to be able to continue to do it. Yeah. You know, I think it's easy, like with everything, it's easier to continue something that's been a part of your life than to start something new. So I think these interventions are particularly interesting where they were really trying to introduce to people something they, they hadn't done before. On the other hand, where I think we could all be, we should be keeping those opportunities in mind. Maybe if you haven't been part of this, a, a church choir before, if they're up and running again, maybe you want to consider doing it if you enjoy singing. I think you're absolutely right. Those could be avenues that, that are, could be accessible. Thanks. Other folks have questions. Go ahead, Kate. There have been studies on that. I didn't review that literature. I mean, there's a lot that I could talk about, so I really focus this more particularly on, on well-being and sort of and self-esteem and personhood. But there is a good literature that shows that, that music can be helpful in, as a, you know, for calming individuals and, and help decrease the need for uh, medication. Hmm, good question. Other folks, Dr. Stoller. Right. So, I mean, music therapy and art therapy are really done for clinical purposes, you know, to help um, in sort of a clinical way. There, there's a very big literature, I didn't touch on this today, particularly in Parkinson's disease. A lot has been done to help uh, alleviate some of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease through drumming and through, you know, um, and those sorts of aspects. So, yes, I think there's definitely a role for from a clinical purpose as well. So I, th I think music and the arts have, uh, have a, I think, 
you know, what we see is that there's a potential for general brain health, but maybe for cognition. We see that it might have a clinical value, both reducing symptoms of agitation or maybe for motor symptoms of Parkinson's. And then it has another dimension, which I'm really sort of calling general well-being in the sense of feeling good about oneself and having a sense of, you know, sort of uh, the opposite of a deficit model of look, not looking at what's missing, but talking about what's retained, retained abilities that connect and, this, and a social dimension. Any buzz? Yeah, go ahead. Kuyo. I'm not aware of one yet. <laughs> Are you interested? <laughs> uh, no, so it was started by a physician, you know, Mary Middleman, but she paired with a, with a very talented conductor. She doesn't conduct it. You know, she helped organize it. She got the funds. She did the research, but there is a, a, talent, a talented musician herself, you know, who, 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 conduct, who leads the group. There may be, very possibly. Good question. Last question, go ahead. Dr. Hussein. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that as well. So I mean, he was involved in you're saying really with art and you know, not just music, which he's known for, but also enjoying art on a personal basis and painting. With that, we'll wrap up. Thanks so much, Dr. Lehman, for okay, great. Thank you.